I don't really have a reason, but I just kind of feel like dunking on YouTube today. So, first of all, and this has nothing to do with this week's video, this month's edition of Fine Woodworking, guess what? Yeah, that's your boy. Now, is it silly? Is it superfluous? Does it have anything to do with what we're talking about? No. Is it an actual denominator? Denominator? Is it an actual marker of success in the industry? Kinda, to some extent, but it's more than that. It's, it's one of those things that like, when you begin your woodworking journey, you kind of dream about being published in fine woodworking, and then it happens, and you just, even though, it's a minor marker. It's still a marker of progress. And you gotta, you gotta find those markers at points in your career, in your progress, in your journey as a woodworker, right? You have to find the things you set out to achieve and that bring you joy when you do achieve them. There's a great deal of value in that. And so it just made me smile and I wanted to share that with y'all in hopes that it makes you smile. I'm not attempting to brag about it. What I'm attempting to do is say like, set a goal for yourself. Go accomplish that goal, whether that's learning how to cut dovetails by hand, whether that's making a table for your family, whether that's getting published and fine woodworking, whatever that thing is, set that goal and set after achieving it. Now, on to this week's video. I woke up this morning with an entirely different plan of what I was going to film today, but when I got to the shop, I needed some kind of release, some kind of playful thing to do. And this is a video I've been thinking about for a while because it just makes me chuckle how certain tips become common practice for no reason outside of you see other people do them. So that's what we're gonna address today. Five tips that I see all across social media, on YouTube, on Instagram, on TikTok, and I never see any professional woodworkers do them. It boggles my mind how they became known as like the thing to do. So without any further ado, let's get to number one. So first up on this list, the old blue tape and CA glue trick. So there's nothing inherently wrong with using blue tape and some super glue as an alternative to double stick tape. It is a thing that in a pinch works really well. I'm not trying to say that it doesn't work. What I am trying to say is, for some reason, over the last few years, this has become like the, the hobbyist, intermediate woodworker way of using double stick tape, instead of just buying double stick tape. And I don't really understand it because number one, every time I've used this setup, it sticks to the wood more than I want it to. And that can be a positive application in some senses, but what I mean by this is it never comes off cleanly and easily. And, then you're in the process of waiting to make sure that the CA glue is fully cured by the time you actually need to work. And then there's the chance that you use too much CA glue and then you get glue all over your wood and now your project is stuck together. It just, like there's a lot of variables in here that I don't understand why this has become such a popular method instead of just using double stick tape. There's a reason this stuff exists and it's brilliant and it's not that expensive. I understand that everybody has blue tape in their shop and that's fine. Again, in a pinch, I've used the blue tape CA glue method and it works, but for 99% of our applications, buy yourself a roll of double stick tape and this will last you years. I think it's this thing of not spending money as a hobbyist, which I get, but this roll of double stick probably cost, I don't know, 10 bucks, maybe. Maybe. I've also had it for probably already a year. I, this is gonna last me until the adhesive fails on this roll, I guarantee it. So spend the extra $5, save yourself a little time. This comes off easier, it's easier to work with, it's cleaner. Or, or don't use the blue tape and CA method if you like that method, if you're happy with it, but it's just a thing that stands out to me as odd how prevalent it's become. Now method number two actually does kind of irk me a little bit. And that is using C-channel to keep a slab flat. The C-channel routed into the bottom of a slab was used originally as an attachment point for legs, which is a perfectly reasonable application for that technique. But for some reason, over a period of time, the internet decided that what that C-channel is doing is actually keeping the slab flat. I started to prep some C-channel for my table, which is going to help the table from warping or twisting in the future. Guys, 
it ain't keeping the slab flat. This is a conversation I've had with many friends of mine, including, but not limited to, Sam from DIY Huntress, who is one of my favorite people on the planet, and I did ask her if I could mention this conversation and use some shots of her video before I filmed this. So, thanks to Sam, and don't worry, I'm not throwing her under the bus. But it's a brilliant point where, like, we've had this conversation, and I tell her that it's not doing anything, and her response is, That's fine, it might not be doing anything, but I just kind of feel better having it there. Which I get. Right? Uh, that, that much I will concede to, but let's not play the game of, I think this is going to prevent the wood from warping. The only way to do that is with proper drying techniques, with proper machining techniques, and allowing the wood to expand and contract with the seasons so that it's not forced to cup or bow to make up for any limitations you're placing on it. I have seen wood blow pieces of steel apart. I've seen it blow pieces of concrete apart. You've seen it blow pieces of concrete apart when you're walking down the sidewalk and a tree right next to it just blows up the sidewalk. That's the pressure that wood can bring to other objects. It is an immensely powerful process as it expands and contracts. Or in this case, warps, twists, cups, bows, whatever it wants to do. So C channel, great for attaching legs, not doing jack all for actually keeping a piece of wood flat. Now, tip number three is less a tip, and it is just a confusion about how a specific product became so ubiquitous in this space. And that product is, of course, Rubio Mono Coat. Now, don't get me wrong, there is nothing wrong with Rubio Mono Coat. It's a solid finish, but I also think it's the result of the echo chamber of social media kind of promoting a single product as the finish that woodworkers use. But I don't know a single woodworker who's not on social media who uses Rubio Mono Coat. And I don't know a single cabinet shop that uses Rubio Mono Coat. It's this weird niche on Instagram and YouTube where it's so prevalent. And so I just want to bring to your attention that there are other alternatives. Now, of course, the advantage or the appeal of Rubio Mono Coat is in its name. Mono Coat, right? Singular Coat. But I also know people who state outwardly that using a second coat really helps the finish and brings up the sheen to a really nice, lovely level. Now, I have no problem with Rubio. It's, it's a good product, don't get me wrong. But Again, there are other alternatives out there, so Osmo being one of them. Osmo is more or less identical to Rubio. I don't know if they are technically chemically identical, but they are both hard wax oils. I know they are very chemically similar, if not identical, and the application process is identical. So this is just another alternative that you have, and just like Rubio, Osmo comes in a number of colors as well. This one being white, this is the finish I used on a project I did in October, November, a little cabinet piece. It's made of ash and nothing more than two coats of white Osmo on top of that. I didn't even bleach it, and it is perfectly and beautifully white. But of course, there are many other finishes, such as my finish, which I'll throw a link to in whichever corner it belongs. This is really nothing more than a polyurethane oil mix with some turpentine to thin it down. This is really my favorite finish, but I admit, that it takes a long time and it takes several coats. And so a product like Rubio does have a real advantage over this finish because it's so quick to apply. So I get that. But there are still other alternatives to the quick drying finishes, such as don't sleep on shellac. It's great, especially when you're using it in an aerosol form, in a spray finish form, which, not for nothing, every cabinet shop I've ever worked in uses almost exclusively, if not exclusively, spray finishes. So spraying shellac is gonna dry quickly, it's gonna look great, it is a brilliant finish. And speaking of brilliant, this week's video is sponsored by Brilliant. Man, I nailed that transition. Brilliant.org is the best way to learn math and science interactively. Now, why is math important to woodworking? That is an excellent question, and even if mildly self-evident, I'm very glad you asked. Brilliant has thousands of lessons, from everyday math, which of course helps with design principles as well as dividing fractions, to physics and engineering, which is literally the foundations of what we do as furniture makers, to a course called Beautiful Geometry, which helps you think intuitively about ratios and patterns, which is literally the foundations of what we do as furniture designers. And new lessons are added monthly. Still not sold, huh? All right. Okay. Fair. 
Hear me out. When I was in high school, I had a physics teacher named Mr. Seabold. Now this is a crazy old kook of a guy with Coke bottle glasses and used to walk around and shoot us with an air cannon just because it brought him some kind of joy. I'm sure there was a physics lesson in there somewhere. But in that class, we learned valuable foundational information about the physical world, from basic mechanical principles to electrical circuitry, which are still lessons that I apply in the shop today. When I'm designing, say, a chair that's gonna be used and abused by families for 50 years, I need to consider the mechanical load each one of those joints is going to take so it doesn't break under the weight of a sitting person. Or when I'm designing a lighting piece or repairing a machine in the shop, that's all simple circuitry right there. So for those among us who, like yours truly, are naturally curious about the physical world and want to continue to expand their knowledge, Luckily, there's Brilliant. If you want to try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash encurtis or click the link down in the description. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Now, back to woodworking. Number four on this list, the yellow glue and sawdust gap filling trick. Now, like literally everything else on this list, there is nothing wrong with this application periodically under the right circumstances, but it is by no means a catch-all solution for filling gaps. This is the thing that just boggles my mind is people just think, drop just all the glue in there and then rub some sawdust in it and for some reason that ups the level of craftsmanship. I'm not saying you gotta be perfect. What I am saying is if you have a gap, consider the best solution for it. Rarely, rarely do I use this trick. There's always going to be a better alternative. Number one, adding more wood on so that there are actual wood fibers where you are trying to make a repair. Sawdust and wood glue does not look like wood fibers. What it's going to look like is putty, which is not high level craftsmanship. The one exception I will say where I do think this is a really useful trick is on dark wood specifically. And not even woods like walnut, because I don't think that's quite dark enough, but I'm talking like black woods. Your wenges, your ebonies, those types of woods where it's almost impossible to tell the difference between the end fibers of those materials when finished and a wood dust filler. But 99% of the time, if there is a gap or if there is an issue that I need to fix, I'm going to first try to do that with actual wood fibers and make a repair rather than make a filler. And if I can't do that, number two, I'm often going to use a more traditional repair technique like say a shellac stick or a burn-in stick that will have a wider array of color choices so I can get a pretty good match that doesn't just look like end grain or sawdust. Now listen, again, I recognize I'm being bougie on this. I'm being a little bit bougie on all of these, but these are things that hobbyists are taking in. They're taking in this information as though this is the best way to fix a thing, or the only way, I should say, to fix a thing. And that's just not the case. So I want to give you other alternatives and other options to expand your toolkit because that's what being a high level craftsman is all about. Having an expansive toolkit and choosing the appropriate application of those tools. Now, on to number five. This is an entire topic in and of itself, and maybe I'll do a video on this. If you want me to, drop a comment down below. But no professional furniture maker uses stain. Now, stain is accessible, stain is easy to acquire from the big box stores. However, no professional is using it. What they're doing instead is adding a colorant to their finish, creating a toner of sorts. Now, very briefly, there are a number of ways you can do this. You have things like these colorants from Mixall, which are great, and they mix with basically everything hence the name Mixall, and they can add a really dense, opaque color to your finish so you get some really rich colors. Another alternative would be these trans tints. These are aniline dyes. Now, these are pretty traditional actually, in fact. And if you see a lot of kind of old timey furniture, for lack of a better word, where they have these bright colored and highly variant undulations in say like tiger maple, it's because they're often using like a honey colorant, which allows that color to really seep into the end grain pores and the undulations. I'm getting really technical now, but this is another alternative. And I use this often, especially in walnut, in order to keep the material from changing color over time. So adding an aniline dye to your finish specifically is going to give you some really nice results. 
Now, that's all I'm gonna say on that subject for right now because again, that is an entire video in and of itself, those different finishing techniques. But I wanted to acknowledge that there are, like everything else on this list, other options available to you outside of stain. So friends, that's that for this week. I hope it was educational, I hope it was entertaining, and I want to be clear. I'm not dunking on any individual in this video. Some of my very closest friends in the world I have met through social media, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, etc. Sam, for example, is one of my favorite people on the planet and we've had this discussion about C channels multiple times. I just want to bring my perspective as a professional, as a trained furniture maker to the conversation in the hopes that this brings you some knowledge about other potential solutions to these problems. That's all. Plus, I kind of didn't want to do joinery this morning. I just wanted to sit down to the camera and talk about things because I was in that kind of mood. So until next week, friends, cheers.